hello again uh roy here on my channel roy reads anything a generally free floating discussion of mainly old books and uh been absent for a while because i was finishing off my dissertation for my master's degree but that's been handed in so um here i am back again and it is the end of the pastiche week for Holmes is where the heart is so that's a reading event i'll put links down below to the uh, the great hosts and uh, that sort of thing and uh it's obviously it's focusing on sherlock holmes the great detective as created by sir arthur conan doyle um, so the pastiche week is about reading Holmes stories not by him so not canonical Conan Cannon stories uh, and given that I was kind of working on other things I was surprised how much I got through actually so I sort of think there's two broad types of Sherlock Holmes pastiches one is where it's like an Arthur Conan Doyle story uh, so you know the tone the mannerisms the the, the setting the type of story all of those are the sort of thing he might have written if you if you actually just happen to oh yeah, he wrote some more stories hooray because we would want that it's brilliant um, and if it's done well it's super enjoyable uh, so that's one one sort of approach and uh, that's where i would put these dennis o smith books as in his lost chronicles of sherlock holmes uh a mammoth mammoth book of lost chronicles of sherlock holmes um i must admit i've only read one so far and really really enjoyed it the adventure of the crimson arrow was it you know an ingenious mystery just all those tonal things and language things were, were spot on and you immersed back in that world of sherlock holmes um getting getting more of what you like in a in a well-crafted way apparently dennis o smith uh, lives in the heart of norfolk england makes occasional trips to london to explore some of the capital's more obscure corners so, top man look forward to reading the rest of that mammoth um then another, another approach to pastiche is to get sherlock holmes to do something a little bit surprising something that conan Doyle couldn't couldn't or wouldn't have written uh so but that he's sort of intriguing or, or cool in some way i mean i've read stories where he's married for instance um but one thing is to bring in the supernatural because there is no supernatural in the the official world of sherlock holmes um he the character is famously disavows the idea of the supernatural ghosts no ghosts need apply um and that's it purely pure rationality is where we're at um so having holmes confront the supernatural is a popular pastime and there's loads of there are collections of of sherlock holmes meeting the meeting various occult detectives for instance um and that's the kind of thing i read i read a story from a collection called gaslight grimoire fantastical tales of sherlock holmes gaslight grimoire um, and the one i read was called the things that shall come upon them Ooh, nice title. brilliant title Fantastic. yeah uh by barbara roden where sherlock holmes collaborates with flaxman low one of the first oh. occult detectives who like holmes appeared appeared in victorian illustrated periodicals um the idea is that he was sort of one of the many detectives springing up while holmes was apparently dead from the reichenbach falls to sort of fill the gap uh so uh, yeah so here's a guy who is a a scientist uh, a psychologist but psychology means like the world of psychic phenomena really in 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 this context um and for him the supernatural is real and it, it, even though he would say it follows natural laws that we just haven't quite discovered yet so they're from two different worlds collaborating to look at the same mystery 
Uh, it's a good story, and I was particularly impressed. No spoilers, but you could imagine that it, it, one or other of them's got to be proved right or wrong. You know, either Holmes has got to accept the supernatural, albeit perhaps provisionally, or Flaxman Lowe's got to say, "Well, that was just a that was a trick. It was all there's a rational explanation." So the fact that the mystery is solved, but both detectives leave with their sort of dignity and worldview intact is a very impressive piece of writing so enjoyed that barbara roden in fact there's a um a collection of just her stuff called i think the thames terror and other stories so that's good um pastiches i guess don't have to only be stories text-based stories there were there were plays in the very early days, been loads of films. Um, so one one medium is that of toiletries and perfume. Oh, God. <laughs> and no! um, poison. So this poison! this 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 box set, ten it's ten years old now, <laughs> is a tie-in with the BBC Sherlock series. Yeah um so the nice picture of benedict cumberbatch martin freeman on the front and um so apparently you get um eau de cologne shave gel shave balm soap and face cloth mm, it all go horribly wrong in its third series <laughs> yes probably um so this was a sort of christmas present for dads of many years ago that's filtered down to the kind of Aldi Central Isle level of a level of um, low expense. Uh, now, ideally, I'd rip this open and we could smell it now and see what it no, smells like. But no. we're so, both so allergic to these kind of things. I'm, if I ever open this, it will be at a safe distance from the house under controlled conditions. Well, I could take it to the university because they've got one of those things with the gloves oh, where brilliant. you like reach in. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Filming, it'd be great. Still, it won't. I've, I've got to at least know what it smells like. It, no, you haven't. Will it smell like Sherlock Holmes himself or like um, Benedict Cumberbatch, Sweet perhaps? Smell of Benedict Cumberbatch. Hmm. Yes. Well, we'll we'll, we'll see. We'll return to that. Um, back in the world of books, I read a whole novel, Prisoner of the Devil, Prisoner of the Devil by Michael Hardwick. So this is another way of having Sherlock Holmes moving out of his normal stamping ground, and that's bringing in something from real history and having him getting involved in that, which, of course, he didn't because, being a fictional character, he couldn't. Um, but in this, it's the Dreyfus Affair. Of 1896, which was a famous at the time corruption in high places, innocent man being uh, sentenced for something he didn't do, some sort of traitorous action sent to Devil's Island. Um, some letters, wasn't it? It was letters, yeah, 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 yeah. There's an element of anti Semitism as well in the fact the way they chose him to sort of pick on for to be the fall guy. Um, so that's the that's the that's the underlying story, and it it takes quite a bit of time. It's got to sort of set that up for people because we don't all know that in detail. Um, but um, once it gets going, it's there's lots of adventurous stuff as well because Holmes actually goes to Devil's Island and infiltrates the the prison island, which is good. Uh, there's also a séance, which is a riot. Um, so yeah, a really a really good Holmes pastiche. Uh, I enjoyed a lot. Um, in my favourite format, the American mass market paperback uh, so with the, the yellow edges. Why are the edges yellow? We don't have yellow edges. We don't have yellow edges. What, what insanity is this? I don't know why American paperbacks often have yellow edges, sometimes other colours, but certainly lots and lots of yellow ones. I really like it, but I don't know why it's there. Does anybody know? Please tell me. Um, Yes, the um, the blurbs are interesting. Reminded me there are certain things that those of us with the, the honour of being born in Britain <laughs> know from the cradle. We just know. 
And one of those things is the difference between your highness and your majesty. So at the request of Her Royal Highness, Sherlock Holmes leaves his Baker Street apartments to meet with, obviously that's going to be a princess, their uh, Queen Victoria. What? No, um, majesty. Jeez, for reasons majesty. known only to Her Majesty. Well, then it goes back to Highness again. Okay, so we'll, we'll forgive them that for it being such a great book. And he wrote another one called Revenge of the Hound. Um, Michael Hardwick also... Oh, he's English. He is English, yeah, yeah. Along with his wife, Molly Hardwick, wrote a whole bunch of these upstairs, downstairs, tie-ins and novelizations. So Upstairs, Downstairs was a long-running TV series. It's aristocrats and servants in a big house. Uh, in London, 165 Eaton Place, that I, I went to once um, as a pilgrimage. Um, it, it's not a real address. 65 Eaton Places, and they paid the people who own 65 Eaton Place to let them stick a number one on the pillar and they film with film people coming in and out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, anyway, yes, so the Hard, Hardwicks wrote a bunch of these, and... Um, I was delighted to once see that in his book, The Private Life of Dr. John Watson, MD, Michael Hard, so it's one of those biographies of a fictional person as if they're real, written by Michael Hardwick. Um, he slips in a thing that connects the two worlds. So in Sherlock Holmes, he has a housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson. Okay. And in Upstairs, Downstairs, the butler, butler guy, uh, is called uh, Angus Hudson. So oh, he... Mr. Hudson! Absolutely. He just, re he just relates those two together, in indicates, subtly indicates as a little Easter egg that they're, they're relatives. So that brings, means that Sherlock Holmes' world and Upstairs, Downstairs world are the same. Even though Sherlock Holmes is mentioned in a couple of episodes. Um, so I like that sort of thing. Um, I happen to be the proud possessor of all of the uh, upstairs, downstairs tie-in books. So um, unless people tell me not to, I might do a video about that one day. Can I just say? Yes. If people think story about aristocrats, servants sounds familiar because um, they've watched Downton. Mm. It's basically because they mined most of Upstairs, Downstairs for Downton Abbey plots. And when they ran out of plots from down, Upstairs, Downstairs, that's when Downton Abbey started to get slightly more ropey. It's true, you know. It's, so it's if my you want opinion. Uh, my if you, opinion. And nobody else's. Jenny's hot take on... The provenance of certain Downton mm. Abbey plots and characters. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yes. Stop a rip off. Oh, Mr. Hudson. Stop it. What? Is that meant to be meant to be Rose? The also meant to be Rose. Rose. The I'll just just before. Order. Order. Yes, in case you wonder what on earth we're talking about, this woman, who is. Rose, one of the maids, played by Jean Marsh, who is a co-creator of the show. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, with Eileen Atkins. Um, yes, is also Bath Morder in Willow and uh, Queen Momby in Return to Oz, where she has the changeable heads. Right. Now, last time, this is where I destroyed the video. So imagine, if you will, a slightly superior video that was the one I... Uh, made earlier and think how much you would have enjoyed that and try to enjoy it like that even though you can't see it 